Hello! You've stumbled across a bonus episode of the Casual Cinecast. In this week's episode, we're talking about Martin Scorsese's The Irishman. And that's it. Welcome to the Casual Cinecast, powered by Cinelinks. My name is Chris, and with me as always is a good fella named Mike. How are you doing today, sir? <laughs> I'm, I'm... You talking to me? I am talking to you. <laughs> but you don't see anybody around, so... Uh, yeah, you had to finish that on your own. I was going to leave you I was gonna leave you hanging <laughs> to see how you get out of that. Well, I hope I did it well enough. Also with us <laughs> is, is a taxi driver named Justin. How are you doing today? Oh, good. I'm good. Uh, taxi driver was much better. I was like, is he going to call me a casino? Because uh, that would be weird. That did cross my mind. But I wasn't going to call you a casino. I was going to say, just got I think he was going to call you the king of comedy. Uh, that also crossed or my mind. Or Boxcar but... Bertha. <laughs> yes. Also yeah. with us is Boxcar Bertha Justin. Cut out all the also rest of it. Also with us is a man who's knocking at my door. <laughs> uh, also with us is Alice doesn't live here anymore. <laughs> all right. <laughs> we covered that. How are you doing, Justin? <laughs> Hugo. <laughs> I mean, good. Cape Fear. <laughs> Silence. If this is your first time listening to the show, normally we like to start off every episode in a section that makes sense. True. Usually. Not, not, not always successful. Yeah. But this is a bonus episode, so we're forgoing our usual section where we talk about news on the march, which is everything we've been watching the last week. And we are just going to go straight into a bonus review of The Irishman. And that's it. If you don't want to see that movie, venture no further. And guys, on behalf of the Irishman, I have a question for you. Okay. But feel free to take the fifth. Do you guys paint houses? My uncle used to paint houses, but oh, that's now that it's in context with this movie, I feel much different about it. <laughs> oh, man. I got nothing. Yeah. So I'm, I guess I'll play the fifth because I can't really. <laughs> All right. Good Good go. Yeah. So here on the Casual Cinecast, we don't paint houses. But what we do do is talk about Criterion films every other week. We're forgoing it for the month of December because there's so many great movies out right now. But in January, we're going to start it back up. The way that works is that we each pick a movie from the Criterion collection and then we put it out to the masses on the interwebs. And then you guys get to vote and choose which film we talk about. Uh, so there's a giant back catalog of films we've done. Umbrellas of Sherberg is the most recent one, if you want to take a listen to that. Uh, otherwise, look forward to new ones like 12 angry men that's coming up and make sure you follow us on twitter but i'll let justin talk to us about all that that's right as chris said you the listener gets to vote on which criterion film we do every other week and if you want to vote in those polls you can follow us on facebook twitter and instagram at casual cinecast also if you want to send us questions or topics to discuss about the films we're going to review each week you can send your questions to those social media accounts you can also email them to casual cinemedia at gmail.com and then of course if you like what you hear you like the show make sure you subscribe to the show and wherever you're listening to podcasts on and uh, also give us a review on itunes give us a five-star review it helps other people find the show so that they can like it and subscribe as well that's right. All right, gentlemen, with that, are we ready to go ahead and move into our thoughts on The Irishman? Yes. Okay. Here we go. It's over. They're all gone. Frank, it's time. It's time you say what happened. <sighs> Frank, I want you to meet my cousin, Russell Buffalino. Better watch. There's a lot of tough guys around here. Did he tell you? You're not afraid of tough guys, are you? I didn't think so. I was one of a thousand working stiffs. I thought I wasn't no more. You got a good friend here. You don't know how good a friend you got. Russell, he took a shine to me right away. After a while... He started giving me little things to do. I know you read a lot of things about me. I just want to say I'm sorry. 
I know I wasn't a good dad. I know that. I know that. I was just trying to, to protect all of you. From what? You didn't see what I see, what I've been through. A friend of ours is having a little trouble. A friend at the top. Hiya, Frank. This is Jimmy Hoffa. Glad to meet you. Big business and the government is on the attack! Do you want to be a part of this fight? A part of this history? Whatever you need me to do, I'm available. Only three people in the world have one of these. And only one of them is Irish. You know how strong I made you? I know things they don't know I know. He said that? You sure he said that? I'm worried nobody threatens Hoffer. I got records, I got tapes. They're done. I had to put you into this thing. Sooner or later, everybody put here as a date when he's gonna go. I know how you feel, Frank. Trust me, I know how you feel. We'll bring you back after get your car. All right, so as always with our films that are currently in theaters or new to streaming, if they are current film, we give a non-spoiler section first, so we'll be speaking generally about the film, won't be giving away any major details or spoilers, and then we'll give you a spoiler alert, play a nice little bumper so that you have plenty of time to pause the podcast, go see the film, and then come back and finish listening to the spoiler section. All right, The Irishman was directed by Martin Scorsese. It was based on the screenplay by Stephen Zalian, Zalian, and based on the book by Charles Brandt. It stars Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, and Joe Pesci. The IMDb synopsis says, A mob hitman recalls his possible involvement with the slaying of Jimmy Hoffa. Boy, am I glad I did not read that synopsis beforehand, because I was very surprised when Jimmy Hoffa shows up. Yeah, you know, uh, I didn't even know it was about Jimmy Hoffa until like the two days before I saw it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I'm kind of bummed that I found out about that, but it ultimately didn't ruin anything. Yeah. No, no, it definitely doesn't. It's it's just one of those things that's like fun to find out. Yeah. So, guys, The Irishman. I think this is a movie that we were, I think it's safe to say, all looking forward to. I think we're all fans of Martin Scorsese here, right? Mm-hmm. Very much so. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Justin, why don't you get us kicked off with your overall thoughts on The Irishman, since uh, I believe you saw it first. Yeah, sure. I'll go ahead. Um, I saw this film first. I, I was in Austin for a fun little weekend trip, and they happened to be playing the movie in a theater, and I wasn't sure if it was going to go even you know, to Houston, where I live, because you know nobody was really sure at that point. So went out of my way spent some extra time in Austin to make sure that I got to go see the movie. I met up with a listener and friend at R Matt Ward, who, who is uh, at real Matt Ward. If you want to read his reviews, he wrote a review on the Irishman as well. Uh, but I watched it with him and I got to say, like, I, I don't think this is like a hot take at this point, but you know, the movie's long, it's three and a half hours, but it is the shortest three and a half hour movie that I've ever watched. I think hmm. uh, because for me, like this movie just, it flew by and not even in the sense that it's a fast paced film. It's just interesting. And to me, like fascinating. And of course, like well acted and well crafted from like start to finish. I was just on board. Like I didn't even get up to go to the bathroom at any point during the movie. I, I sat in the seat from start to finish, which is something I was very worried about, especially because I drank a lot of tea before I went, which was a giant mistake. Yeah, <laughs> sounds like it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I was enthralled. I think the last hour or so of the movie really started to solidify this film as like one of the great films of the year for me. I, I do think it is a great film. Uh, prior to that, I thought, 
it was good and enjoyable and interesting. And like I said, it moved, but it's, it's maybe that last hour, 45 minutes. I'm not totally sure exactly how long, <laughs> but it, the, the movie just really started to grab me and really started to connect with me much deeper than I ever thought this movie would. And probably deeper than any other like gangster film that I can think of. Definitely. I think it grabbed me more than, you know, any of Martin Scorsese's other gangster film, like on like a deep personal level and really like made me think and left me thinking as I walked out of the theater and, you know, was driving home. Uh, and like that night, like I was still thinking about this in a way that I never thought about, you know, like Goodfellas or even the Godfather or, um, you know, casino, any of those films. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I guess I don't want to like go on too long. I'll let you guys talk about it. Um, I think it's, I think it's great. I think it's one of the great films of the year and it had a whole lot to live up to. So I think it's even like more impressive <laughs> that like after all the hype and all of the situations surrounding it, is it going to be in theaters? Is it not going to be in theaters? Like it's three and a half hours long. Like, is that too long? How can it, you know, is that going to be good? I don't know. You know, I think with all of the baggage that goes along with it, it's even more impressive to me that I feel so strongly about it. Like it's, it's just, I don't know. It's a blast. It's it's awesome to see Martin Scorsese at this point in his career come to do this movie with all of these actors, uh, De Niro, Pacino, P Pesci, uh, Harvey Cattell, like at the point that they are in their career, it just feels so right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I'm just over the moon about it. And uh, I will let whoever wants to go next, talk about it now. Yeah, I'll go next. Like you, I've been a fan of Martin Scorsese for a long time. Uh, I first got into him through taxi driver. You know, and then kind of just went through his whole filmography from there. I have followed him, I don't know, since I was like 16 years old, I think. So when this movie was coming out and being made, I was kind of following it roughly. I didn't really want to know a whole lot about it other than there was a movie called The Irishman being made with um, Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, Joe Pesci. And there was lots of de-aging technology and the budget kept going crazy <laughs> as a result of it. Right. So kind of like you. There was a lot going against this movie before I even got into the theater, right? So there was the whole production hell that it went through. Then there was the whole, like, de-aging technology, which people have been talking about for, like, two years, it seems like. How's it going to look? Is it going to look bad? Most de-aging technology does look bad. How are they going to make a serious drama that's going to be critically well-received and be, like, a classic with this technology that always looks like shit, you know? Yeah, and the technology we'd seen, I think, mostly to that point in, like, comic book movies and yeah. superhero things you know yeah the only movie that used it, yeah artistically like this that i can think of was benjamin button right yeah that is, that would be an exception totally um but even then it it looked you could see the seams right um, yeah it, it didn't look great yeah so this movie had a lot going for it right so whenever you saw it in theaters and you said that it was you you really liked it it was really good that surprised me you know, mm -hmm. uh, not because you don't have wonderful taste, but because mm -hmm. you have mentioned on this podcast before that when things get built up in the cultural conversation, it sometimes you feel disappointed in that. Yeah. And that's what I was expecting to happen to me, not to you. Right. But like when you told me that it was like excellent and exceptional, I was like, oh, man, am I going to like it this much? You know, because <laughs> like some of the best Martin Scorsese movies, like it's a high bar to clear. Yeah, you know, totally. he's done Goodfellas, he's done King of Comedy, Taxi Driver, you know, you name it. His top five would be a hard top five to crack. So anyway, I went to see this movie in theaters probably like a week before it released on Netflix. Uh, I traveled two hours to see it in Dallas with my girlfriend. We were back really late, but I really wanted to see it. And I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, this is another gangster movie with uh, Martin Scorsese, Joe Pesci, and Robert De Niro. I hear that a lot, you know, um, especially since Martin Scorsese was bashing Marvel movies. So now everyone has to defend the Marvel movies against the evil Martin Scorsese. And I keep hearing them talk about how, like, yeah, the Marvel movies, he's saying that there's nothing new and original about them. And he's doing the same thing here. It's just another gangster movie with the same actors. I understand that. I do. I sympathize with that. Because before I sat down, even going through my brain, I was thinking to myself... How can they do anything new with this, with these actors, with this subject matter, right? Mm -hmm. But they do. This movie, 
unlike Goodfellas, unlike Casino, unlike anything Scorsese has done, this movie is about life and death and choices and time and regret and um, introspection. There's just so much that you can take from the last hour of this movie that offers you a almost a treasure chest of riches that that the Goodfellas never even attempted to touch. This movie may not, may not be as high adrenaline as something like Goodfellas, right? Like it may not be as um, fast paced, as easy to watch. You wouldn't want to add this into like a like a double feature or just like watch it on cable one afternoon. You would want to actually sit down to watch The Irishman. It's not a funny movie. There's no memes that are going to come from it, probably, you know, but you never know. But I saw a Joe Pesci <laughs> Baby Yoda meme. There you go. So there's always some stupid person on the internet that's going to make a meme <laughs> out of something, right? But it's not. Um, there is a meme about it actually going around that I've seen. Okay. Well, there you go. But <laughs> but the point is, it's not a movie that d- like that draws attention to itself in the same way that like uh, Goodfellas does. You're not supposed to leave jazzed. You're supposed to leave introspective. So I'll keep it short and pass it over to Chris, but let's just say I really, really, really enjoyed this movie more than I thought I would. I don't know exactly where it'll fall at the end of the year yet, but this is one of my favorite Martin Scorsese movies, and that is saying quite a bit. I think there's enough here to say to justify this movie being made, and I do not agree that this is just a rehash of what we've already seen before. So if if that is what your impression of this movie is... That's not it. Yeah, it's absolutely not a rehash or it takes stuff that he's already dealt with and shines a new light on it. It's it's like Ozu's who I would think about, you know, like Ozu made a lot of movies that were about the same thing, uh, you know, marrying people's daughters off and stuff like that. But each time he makes the same story, it's from a different perspective or there's something new to it. Uh, Same things here. Same thing here. Uh, you get it's it's about gangsters, sure. Has he covered that before? Yes, but there's something new to it. And you're right; it's about coming to the end of your life and looking back on it. And that's uh, really interesting to me, and r- really good. And the thing that's new about this, uh, and it's something that I don't know if Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci could have made 20 years ago. Exactly. Yeah, that's that was actually. Yeah, this is. Uh, the development of Martin Scorsese as a as he gets older, you know, and um, you get to see like him kind of deal with these issues on screen. And I'm sure the other movies are him dealing with certain issues as well. Uh, one of the things I really find fascinating about this film, and I think it speaks to how good it is, uh, is the de-aging technology uh, leading up to this film. That's all anybody could talk about uh, with this film, or at least that's what it felt like to me. Uh, but once it came out, well, if, it was the wild card, right, right? Right. Like it was the thing that we were all waiting to like have it prove to us. Right. Um, but once it came out, you know, like I, there was very little talking, uh, talk about the, uh, de-aging technology because the movie's so good. Uh, is the de-aging technology perfect? No. Does it matter? <laughs> no, it doesn't because, uh, everything else shines so bright that I can forgive it. Uh, well, well. Let's put it this way. Is the de-aging technology perfect? No, like you said. But does it beat anything that practical makeup could do for yes, these yeah, for sure. 80-year-old men playing these <laughs> in these parts, right? Like yeah. the de-aging technology, while not perfect, you know, makeup, old age makeup and, and young person makeup have never been perfect in the history of movies. So and of course, there's also the other option besides makeup, and that would be to like cast a younger De Niro, right? And I, and I think this is is less distracting than either of those options. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, there is one moment where Robert De Niro is beating somebody up, and you can kind of tell that it's old Robert De Niro beating somebody yeah. up. Uh, and it, it, that's it, those things aren't a big deal to me. Uh, I don't. But yeah, like you guys, you guys have covered a lot of stuff, and I, I'm. I'm in the same boat with you guys. I like this movie a lot. Yeah, I'm excited to talk more in, in depth with you guys. So, Yeah, I agree with you about the uh, the fight scene with Robert De Niro. There's not many places in this movie where I can really feel the age shining through. Mm-hmm. But where Robert De Niro is um, fighting somebody on a street corner. 
Yeah, he's, he's supposed to be violent. Pretty early in the movie, that's uh, that's that's a pretty clear indicator that <laughs> yeah, that is not young Robert De Niro. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah. So real quick, before we get into spoilers, I wanted to ask you guys: Do you think this movie will get any Oscar love? If so, will it be for acting, directing? What do you think? I know the Academy is pretty at war with Netflix right now, so the politics might get in the way of everything. But as far as merits go, um, what do you guys think? I think if the politics can be looked past, if they end up being looked past, and it starts to get some Oscar love, I easily see it being nominated for Best Picture and Scorsese for Best Director. Uh, screenplay, and then I think I think at least De Niro and Joe Pesci will be nominated for acting. No Pacino? I mean, I would say so, but I'm, you know, I'm trying to make a smart bet here and say at least the, <laughs> the other two. Yeah. Um, but I think if, if it gets any nominations, it'll get a bunch uh, like those or or it'll get none. I, I think I see a scenario where it's just Joe Pesci. Uh, I think Joe Pesci is the standout here uh, to me, at least. Um, well, it's because he's doing the thing that like we didn't expect of him, like Joe Pesci in a Martin Scorsese movie is always the dude that's about to fly off the handle and murder anyone at the drop of a hat. But this one, he's so, like, cool and collected. It's a different character altogether, really. Yeah. I think that's another thing that the movie had going against it, I think, is, you know, we've talked about the de-aging and uh, the length and Scorsese versus Marvel, but, like, just the, it being a Netflix movie in general and Scorsese doing a Netflix movie, I felt a little bit of that of like, you know, oh, it's Netflix, you know. I think it's just extra bad baggage. I don't necessarily think it means like people thought that means it's going to be a bad movie. Right. There's, there's just still a weirdness about Netflix and like theatrical releases and stuff like. Um. I don't know. I think it's improving Netflix's track record. I'm hoping that this inspires some confidence in, in certain Netflix movies. Like, well, I, I think that's been you know? going that way for the past couple of years. Like when we started with the, the Mayerowitz stories, um, Ballad of Buster Scruggs, Roma, like there's been a few movies over the past couple of years that they've really been trying to throw their hat in the ring. Problem is there's maybe like four or five like Oscar buzzy movies each year. And then Netflix puts out like 50 movies. Yeah, they do they they do kind of buy their Oscars, you know, like I think then they've kind of done that this year again like uh and not buy their Oscars, but they pick films that they kind of make a bigger deal about that they well, want to be Well, it seems like Oscar. every year they they try to champion like one art house director that's well received. Mhm. Or one or two. And then like finance those movies and then the rest of the movies they can finance can be crap as long as they have like the like a Coen Brothers movie this year or a Scorsese movie this year or an Alfonso Cuaron movie next year, you know? Yeah, they want uh, they have their showcase pieces. Uh, right. They they want to have like their tentpole like awards buzz movies, but then they also don't want to do that too much because those don't, I imagine, make as much money as like something like or like get them as many subscriptions as something like Bright or <laughs> something that sucks. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think that's kind of any studio to a certain extent. Um, they have their big tent poles I, like that they put out in order to get Oscar buzz. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But they also put out, you know, mediocre movies throughout the year as well. Um, and well let me frame it this way, though. Thank God that Netflix is making movies like this because Scorsese was not able to get this movie financed anywhere else. Movies like this, like in the 90s, this could have been financed. Mm -hmm. In the last 20 years, not so much. So I'm like, I'm just glad that for the time being, Netflix wants that Oscar love. They want to be legitimate. So as long as they have that itch and they're willing to throw money down the drain for movies like this, I think we should stop giving Netflix such a hard time. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I, I, marriage Story is another one that wouldn't have gotten made. I don't think uh, it's probably, it was a lot cheaper, but once again, it's just a movie that 
is hard to get made in the, the current Hollywood. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I kind of just wish Netflix and the movie theaters would uh, work things out and so they could release them. You know, I think Netflix <laughs> is even OK if they if it's both in the theater and on their service at the same time. I I would love to be able to go see it in the theater at the same time that it's on. You know, I would choose the theater over watching it at home uh, or I could, you know. So anyways, uh, um. Do, do any of you guys have anything else uh, before non or before we move into spoilers? No. Uh, other than to say, I recommend it. It's in the some of the top tier Scorsese. I don't know where it would rest yet, but um, you know, this is better than most things Scorsese has done in the last ten years. And I've been a fan of Scorsese pretty much the whole time. I don't know that he's ever really hit that rough patch that most directors seem to get. There may be the occasional movie every now and then that I don't like as much as the next one, but I don't know that he's ever had like two or three movies in a row that haven't merited some kind of attention. Even a movie like Shutter Island, which is basically genre, you know, a genre piece, I I find interesting and fun to watch. And I think yeah, mainly because of Martin Scorsese. So Yeah, I agree. It's a well put together thriller. Like the man mm-hmm. understands emotion in cinema. He understands how to like even making like a standard movie. He understands the pacing and the tone to get you where you need to be, even in the most um, basic story. Yeah. And I do have yeah. to kind of sh- shout out, I, like, I feel like Scorsese, even more than like Tarantino, uh, really introduced me to a lot of films. I remember over at your guys' house, uh, watching like my voyage to Italy or my voyage through American cinema and stuff like that. Uh, mm-hmm. So you're the person who broke into our house and watched that. Yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> I, I've, damn it, I don't have a response to that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Anyways, I, I appreciate all the work he does behind the scenes too. And in cinema, uh, that makes me appreciate him more. Thank you, Martin Scorsese, if you're listening. Yeah, and, and I think he is a guy that seems like he wants to do, you know, that when a technology is out there he wants to see what he can do with it at least with the example of hugo because i remember it also being a big deal when hugo was coming out that oh martin scorsese was doing a 3d film and at that time 3d was a little bit of a joke Mm -hmm. you know and and at least among like people who were like really into film and not just in like the popcorn novelty of it eight to nine years off the first avatar so, and they were still trying to push 3D. Yeah, and it was mostly very largely unsuccessful. But here comes Martin Scorsese with this, you know, family film <laughs> that's in 3D, and you're just like, what? Like, how is this going to turn out? So, like, he's not afraid to like push the boundaries and like experiment with something like that and see what can be done with it, and you know, in my opinion, be successful. I agree. Yep. Do you guys want to give the film a rating real quick? Out of five? Oof. Yeah. Um, before we get into the spoilers, I would say this is somewhere between four and a half and five to me. Yeah, I'm I'm at five uh, based on initial reaction and just how I've been thinking about it. Uh, I haven't mm-hmm. really softened on that view since walking no, out I of the I even theater. watched it again on Netflix the other day. Oh, nice. wow. Good for you. I, so seen it I twice. wanted to do that. I just never didn't have the damn time with Thanksgiving. But Chris, what do you think? The similarities, yeah, I'm I'm definitely at five too. You know, like uh, there's, or f- it's that's not what your letterbox says. It, what does my letterbox say? Is it four? <laughs> four. Yeah. So it's always hard for me to just go five. You know, like uh, I know you never do it. I, it's, it's scary, guys. It's scary to commit to a five star <laughs> rating. Um, but yeah, I think that this is uh up there, and I would put it four and a half or five. Awesome. Yeah. So needless to say that we are all pretty enthusiastic about it. So uh, I guess it's time to get into spoilers. Yes. Yes, I think so. No, I guess Rosebud is just a piece in a jigsaw puzzle. Give me one of those cigarettes you got up there. I'll tell you all about it. Things are going to start happening to me now. And here we go. So one thing that I really appreciate about this movie is that it's constantly reminding you that death is looming. Like as we meet so many of these people in the prime of their lives, we see their death information just pop up on the screen. 
yeah like method of death and yeah year and win the year so we like know most of these people have less than like five years left to live when we even meet them yeah i I like how often that pops up and and like the timing of like popping it up when we're introduced to characters as well like Mm -hmm. as opposed to you know maybe the last time we see that character right in the film it's very much like robert de niro looking back at his life right and then like when you look back you know the whole picture already right when you're living it you don't know the whole picture you're living it but he's looking back now and he can be like oh yeah that memory where i met so and so this is how he died he got shot in the face three times like six years later you know i think that's a really powerful thing because this movie is constantly always no matter what reminding you that death is coming it's Mm -hmm. always coming no matter what kind of life you live no matter how you follow orders how you don't we're all going to the same place. And I don't, like I said earlier, I don't know if this is a movie that could have even been made by Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro 20 years ago. I think this is something that can only be made by someone who is in their 70s thinking about this yeah. stuff pretty frequently. What does your life mean? Is your life ultimately just the the sum of all your choices? Can you be forgiven? Do you believe in that kind of thing? These are all questions that the Irishman wrestles with, especially in the last hour, that makes the gangster setting so poignant and so, um, yeah, just resonant, I guess. Is, uh, because this whole movie, these these people live violent, terrible lives, and we see them in the, the prime of their lives having fun, but it's constantly reminding you of how it ends. And even if it doesn't end violently and shortly um, in some getting shot in the back of the head kind of way, then best case scenario, you just sit around and wait to die and think about your actions. Yeah, I I think one of the things that you're, you're kind of touching on that I found really poignant as well is the things you find really important, like through your, the middle of your life, like what you're working towards and what you're trying right. to do. Mm-hmm. ultimately like as you look back will seem fruitless you know like and what well, really matters well, right your loyalties the people yeah. you think you should be loyal to mm-hmm. eventually they will be dead yeah and, and then all you have at the end is like the weight of your decisions and did you make the right decision or the wrong decision were you loyal to the right people or the wrong people you know right and even then you know like he was doing all this for his family, you know, and I think that that's a common theme in uh, mafia movies and stuff like that. Well, that's what he tells himself. Yeah. But at the end of his life, all he wanted was to reconnect with his family, but because of his loyalties and where he uh, was headed and what he did in the middle of his life that he thought was really important, uh, he's disconnected and they won't, some of them won't talk to him. And I've, you know, that's, I think really, uh, poignant and uh touching yeah i mean that's like the stuff that this film versus any other gangster film that i can think of really you know feels unique and that's what really you know i walked away from the film just thinking about and like couldn't really shake afterwards I'm i'm gonna make a controversial statement here okay so of all the gangster movies I've seen, and this movie's better than the movie I'm about to reference, so I want to make that perfectly clear right now. <clears throat> the only other gangster movie that really touched on the idea of growing old, reflecting on your actions, and then dying of like natural causes like this was The Godfather Part 3. <laughs> yeah, it's the one no one likes. I've seen the comparisons. Exactly. Like The Godfather Part 3 wanted to be this movie. Well, yeah, but I mean, spoilers for the Godfather Godfather Part Three right now. Uh, does anyone remember that? It's Not very so well because I've only seen it once. Okay, so uh, Michael Corleone, which is Al Pacino in that movie, right? Like through the end of the first one, all throughout the second one, and the third one, he is taken over from Marlon Brando after Marlon Brando gets shot. Now, originally, I think if I remember the the commentary correctly, I think. Francis Ford Coppola wanted to call The Godfather Part 3 with a subtitle called The Death of Michael Corleone. And at the end of The Godfather Part 3, the normal movie happens, but at the very, very end, it just it cuts to an indeterminable amount of time later. 
of Al Pacino just sitting in a chair as an old man. And he just falls over dead. Right. Of natural causes. And we don't know how long later. We don't know when it happened. But we know that he didn't get his comeuppance for everything that he deserved. And this movie kind of tries to deal with that exact same thing. But uh, in my opinion, in a much more graceful, satisfying way. Um, Because I haven't seen The Godfather Part 3 in a really, really long time. But for some reason, I always remembered the death of Michael Corleone in that movie. Right. Well, I think this movie, (laughs) there is comeuppance in a way, but not the comeuppance of he finally gets, you know, offed. Right. It's just the comeuppance of age and Mm -hmm. loneliness. And, And looking back and, you know, that really like talking about his regrets and his family and everything that leads me to think about Anna Paquin's character, uh, which has been a bit of a controversial character. And I wanted to hear your guys thoughts on it. And um, just in case you guys don't know, or if anyone doesn't know that she's been the subject of controversy because she doesn't speak very much. Right. And there have been people calling that, some sort of a uh, misogynistic uh, action on Martin Scorsese's part to not give a, the main, like one of the main women characters a speaking line. Sure. Um, <laughs> which I think is uh, ridiculous, but I want to hear what you guys think. Well, let me first start off to say that um, I am a male, a straight male. Um, so take my opinion, however you'd like. But what I would say is I agree. Well, here's what I would say. Not every single movie needs to have every single kind of person with an equal part. Like, I'm not going to watch Fifty Shades of Grey and expect to have two straight dudes talking about what's going on in the plot, right? So I don't think it's fair to take a movie that's so singularly about a hitman and the people a hitman would surround himself with and then say that they don't give equal roles to every single kind of person Mm -hmm. because not every movie calls for every single type of person. Like I said, take with that what you will. But what I would say is the reason it's like that in this movie is part of Frank's uh, journey, right? He loses that affection with that daughter. Right. Like, by the time she becomes Anna Paquin, she's still the same character she was when the other little girl was playing her, and she's still supposed to hate her dad. So it's not like just because a few years in the story has increased and we cast a new actress, so we have to, like, reset that plot line and have his daughter talk to him a little bit and then go back to not talking to him. That would be bad storytelling. So it's I I understand people saying, like, there's not enough women roles in this movie. There's not. There's like no women roles in this movie that are good, but I don't think that it's from a misogynistic place or like a, a place that deserves to to call it out because it fits the story. Yeah. I, I, I think my thoughts on it, well, are not unsimilar to the two of you, but although also I'm a straight white male, so for whatever it's worth, um, one of the things I had to learn about in acting (laughs) uh like when i did a lot of theater and stuff uh it it doesn't matter how many lines you have (laughs) you're still acting right (laughs) and well her performance is one of the most emotional parts of the movie in my opinion yes and i think uh the same complaint was leveled at uh once upon a time in hollywood earlier this year and once again, she's on screen for a lot of the time. She doesn't do a lot of talking, but I, I love that character. She's acting and acting is, uh, you know, is something. I, I I think what I would say, too, is it, you're right. Not everybody needs to be in every movie. <laughs> uh, what needs to happen probably is there needs to be more movies uh, like Waves, for instance, uh, that's a, a about minorities or, you know, about. The, those other characters, but not everybody needs to be in every movie. But I'm sorry, I want to I want to clarify what I was saying earlier. I not everyone should be in every movie, but I think that it's a it's always a good practice to try to and like fit as much into every movie as you can and make sure everyone's represented if the role calls for it. 
with with Anna Paquin's scene where she says nothing, or her scenes where she says nothing, she's doing more emotion and giving me as an audience more emotion. They're powerful. You don't forget that she's yeah, in the film. than anything else in the movie has because. I know he loves his daughter, even if his daughter isn't the one of the main characters of the movie. Her silence says more than she could have ever actually said. I agree. But I also understand and I sympathize with the idea that um, sometimes these gangster movies just inherently aren't good to women characters. That said, that's just a subject for like, maybe that says something we should make more roles that or make more movies that offer those kinds of roles. But yes. I don't agree that we should try to to force just for the sake of having everyone involved, everyone into every movie. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think regardless of any of that inclusion or whatever and movies, I think the main point for me is that she does have one of the most powerful performances in the movie and says the most and has a much bigger effect on the main character by the end of the film than anybody else in the movie just about, you know, um, like all of his actions and all of the things, like when he's talking to the priest in the end of the movie, I mean, he just doesn't really seem to be that like torn up about all of these people that he knew and whatnot and whether or not he's suppressing some of those feelings that that could be argued. But the big thing towards the end of the movie is like his relationship with his daughter and that's what's affecting him. And so, like, to me, it's, it's like arguing that she doesn't have a lot to do because she's not speaking. It's like it's, it feels very belittling to what she is doing and, like, taking away from what she – putting yeah. the focus not on what she's doing because she is maybe one of the most important characters in the movie. Right. Well, it almost feels like if if one of your actual serious, like, knocks against the movie, when you walk away from this, like, if you rack – her performance up as like one of the cons of the movie, then I would argue that you did not get the movie. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's, it's pretty fair or you're at least not, and you're not watching the movie and not on the same wavelength as, as the movie because you're looking for the right. Wrong you're not watching the movie that Martin Scorsese was making. You're watching the movie that you thought you were watching when you sat down. Yeah. I mean, but that, yeah. that essentially goes like, yeah, she's the, the crux of the movie to a certain extent. And just because she doesn't speak very much doesn't mean that she's not important. Which, speaking yeah. of her character, I really enjoyed all the scenes where uh, Joe Pesci's character was really trying to get her to like him. <laughs> yeah. But he's just so inherently off-putting and creepy, and she's not an idiot, so she, like, can see through his bullshit. And, like, yeah. I was terrified. Every time he was, like, trying to give her a gift or trying to be, like... Or every time he would, like comment his like frustrations to Robert De Niro be like I don't think she likes me very much I was like oh god oh god don't take any interest <laughs> in her Joe Pesci just stop yeah. trying to make her like you you know because I did not want her him getting mad at her basically at any point in the movie yeah, yeah it's it's pretty unnerving <laughs> but it, it is funny to see well in some of the later scenes where she immediately takes to uh, Jimmy Hoffa slash Al Pacino <laughs> Well, because he's such an honest man and he's such a he's such an open book and he's so like um, affectionate, whereas like Robert De Niro's idea of affection is like almost killing the shop owner that hurt her. Right. But like Jimmy Hoffa's like, let's share an ice cream. Let's sit next to each other. Let me talk to you and engage with you and like treat you like a human being. Whereas like Robert De Niro, he didn't know the first thing about talking to her. At least I never got the impression that he did. He didn't understand the first thing about being a daughter or being a father or like what a daughter would want or like what would make her feel safe. Yeah. And I do think like uh, it's really, I want to say fun, I guess, but that's not the right word, but like uh, impressive to watch uh, Scorsese handle like the scene where he does find out that the daughter was like, was she like hit or pushed or something by the pushed or like shoved. pushed. That's right pushed by the the shop owner and you're almost like you're kind of almost on his side yeah i was and like you, yeah go like, fuck him up robert de niro yeah and then but as soon as he gets in there and starts fighting him it's like oh wow <laughs> too far <laughs> too and, far uh, just like yeah basically i just i i appreciate like that ability to like feel one way and then just immediately be like oh Mm, and like have that moment like so like precisely handled and delivered. Mm -hmm. 
Like you, good. you can see what they're talking about later on in the film when the wife's or the his one of his daughters is talking to him and like we couldn't come to you with any of our problems otherwise you'd like beat him up you know like you you take it too far you know like it's one of the things that you know pushed everybody away. Oh yeah, I love that scene at the end with like his uh the daughter that doesn't really get a whole lot of screen time throughout the whole movie but, except for that scene. But she's like, you know, we couldn't talk to you about anything and he's like he doesn't know how to answer so he gives one of his non-answers where he just kind of like rambles for a minute. And like, essentially, he's like, well, you know, I mean, I just tried to like, you know, protect you at all times and like, you know, just do what I had to do. Because, you know, like, it was just a time where I just I kind of just had to do what I had to do to protect everybody. And she's like, what are you talking about? And he has no answer for her. This was just like he never thought he's not capable of the kind of like self-reflection to like realize the error of his ways. Like, I don't even understand. I think even as an old man, I don't think he understands where he went wrong. And I think that's kind of the tragedy of it all, which is like he's so incapable of being a father or being a loved one to anyone. He's such a good soldier. You know, he just wants to follow orders. Yeah. That's what he deems a successful life. That like I think he views himself more as a victim at the end of the movie than anything. Like I think he understands that his actions got him there, but I don't think that he could like pinpoint the time where it all went wrong. Right. And – where do you think that that comes from? Is that like a, just like a genetics, like personality, the way he was raised? Because as you said, he's like a good soldier, but you know, we do get the part where he's talking about like being a good soldier. And he was like, a, we get the impression that he was a pretty good soldier in the army because he could follow orders. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what makes him successful in, you know, the mob mafia, whatever it is. Um, well, it's, it's interesting. I watched uh, Shutter Island the other day uh, with my girlfriend. That movie has a lot to do with the aftermath of World War II and what it did to people. And I think The Irishman has a, a lot to do with the same thing, which is to say that I think the war messes a lot of people up. I, I don't know if Robert De Niro's character Frank would have been the same guy had he not been given some pretty um, atrocious orders in the army. Go out there, make those two dudes dig their own graves and kill them no matter what they do. Like... That's a job that will strip you of your humanity pretty quick. Yeah. I mean, he's been murdering people for so long. That's why he can't put his finger on where it all went wrong because he was yeah. like 18 where it all went wrong, you know, like, and he just didn't realize it yet. And he was doing what everyone told him yeah. was the right thing to do. And exactly. then all of a sudden he gets out of the army and he has some people telling him it's the right thing to do. And then he has some people telling him it's the wrong thing to do. Yeah. So you guys think that it, it stems from the war. And that's if if we were to like just try to trace back this idea that he has of, you know, doing doing what people ask and, you know, keeping your head down. Just like, yes, sir. Well, he kind of talks about it a little bit. He says that, like, you know, you did what you were told. You got a reward. Like he says that, like, during his time coming up in the mob. And so I think it's like the idea that an older man like a Joe Pesci type would come up to you, tell you you're a good kid. And say, I got work for you to do. You, you look like someone who could follow orders and keep your head down. And that's always what he's been valued for. And it seems like he's never had to really put himself out there for anybody. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think, I just think he's completely incapable of doing that by the time his daughters are born. And I think he understands that as an old man, but I don't think he ever learned so much that where he's capable of looking back on himself and, and really feeling bad for what he's done or, or, or like looking back and, and determining that the life he led was wrong, which I think makes it all the more tragic. The idea that he doesn't understand his old age as much. You know what I mean? The idea that like he thinks he can still make it up to her. So he's still trying, but it's kind of pathetic, I guess, and sad because he's an old man and he's clueless. Yeah. The bank scene. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The bank scene is what I'm thinking of. It's like he thought that would work, <laughs> but like. Me as an audience member, as soon as he was in the line and I knew what he was doing, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I'm a customer. She has to talk to me. Right. And, and we, knew it wouldn't, we knew it wouldn't work, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just based on the, the intro to that scene. So, yeah. Anna Paquin's voiceless role, I think, contributes all to that. You know, it's just the disgust in her face. Yeah. So, before we wrap all this up, we haven't really talked about Al Pacino at all. And I wanted to say that I actually really enjoyed Al Pacino's role in this. And I enjoyed Robert De Niro and Al Pacino feeding off of one another in this. Uh, there's one particular scene that I really enjoyed between the two of them. Uh, that's the one where 
like he's yelling at his like henchmen essentially and Robert yeah. De Niro is in the room but Robert De Niro's fed up with it and he's like I won't be talked to oh, yeah. to like that and he leaves the room and then Al Pacino's like why are you leaving you know and he's like I won't be talked to and it's like they had this miscommunication I didn't even know you were there <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah like, what do you mean yeah. I was in the room I was standing there <laughs> yeah and that totally sets up Jimmy Hoffa's character for the end of the movie too because it sets up Jimmy Hoffa as this character that like flies off the handle, gets mad first, says whatever he's going to say, and then afterwards tries to deal with the consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Al Pacino in general is just like really charming and like really fun and charismatic in the film and like really, you know, moves the scenes that he's in. (laughs) I I think back and like laugh about the scene uh, where he's in court and the guy who comes up with a gun. Yes. And he's complimenting uh, Jesse Plemons' character. Yeah, his son. And he's like, yeah, he's like, he's like, he charged a man with the gun. He's like, you always charge a man with the gun. If he's got a knife, you run away. <laughs> yeah. With a gun, you charge. It's like, just that whole scene is really funny to me. Yeah. Um, And, and the other thing that Al Pacino does really well is like, he, you know, he has a, a tendency or he has the capability of going over the top. And I, I don't know that he, he walks that line of going over the top because I think Jimmy Hoffa just in general is an over the top character but he never goes too far he's never hoo hawing you know or anything like that uh, well scorsese's good at like making characters that feel kind of over the top but like are always funny and charming mm-hmm. like there's that one scene that was like a total scorsese scene that just felt like something out of like either goodfellas or wolf of wall street or something but it's like where they come to uh to arrest the short italian guy that like jimmy hoffa hates mm-hmm. throughout the whole movie yeah yeah and like as they're arresting him, they they have the handcuffs on him, but like the officers are walking with him, but he just runs ahead of the officer like five feet, oh, just yeah. to make the officer like run to catch up with him. Yeah, and then he laughs just just while he's getting arrested, just to make his friends laugh, <laughs> who are just sitting there watching him get arrested. Yeah, he has no fear right. of him. Yeah, and it's just like that's funny to me. Like that's just like a like that could be so over the top in any other movie, but for some reason Scorsese's good at that kind of humor, which is just like these criminals that like have no respect for anything. Yeah, I think I think that's one of the things that's so interesting in these movies is like that I think about like with these characters like the lack of like fear. I get you know I about like have a panic attack if I pass a cop and I'm like oh god I was doing like four over the speed limit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of I mean that's the appeal of these characters and oftentimes also Martin Scorsese comes under. Uh, attack for making these characters appealing but one of the things that is very appealing is having no fear of the consequences of breaking the law i mean all of them eventually that catches up to them yeah it's it's entertaining to watch at the very least mm-hmm. also a quick shout out i think ray romano is really oh funny. yeah yeah he's <laughs> ray romano is a really good actor yeah he's been turning in those roles like uh, i recently watched the big sick finally mm. and uh he's really good on that too really funny yeah. oh yeah the big sick is a good movie but yeah, I just uh, wanted to call him out. I think one of the best scenes in this movie is the scene when Joe Pesci can't eat bread in prison. And he starts getting more religious as he gets older and stuff, you know? And, like, Robert De Niro's like, you going to church? What are you doing? And he's like, you'll see. And then, like, later in the movie, like, Robert De Niro, like, has, like, a priest yeah. that he's confessing to and stuff like that. So it just kind of shows you, like, the older you get and the closer to death you are, the more like even the most non-believers will be like, you know what? I'm going to cover my bases. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just talk to a priest real quick. We haven't really talked about the last line of the film and like the last shot, uh, which is, uh, I don't remember the line exactly, but De Niro basically says something like, I like to leave the door open a little bit. Yeah, like leave the door open, like I'll be right here, basically, like when the guy gets back from Christmas vacation. Uh, I, I'm curious what you guys thought about that like the that line and that last shot it's kind of the beauty of this whole movie and the whole last act it's kind of encapsulated in that last 10 minutes you know like mm-hmm. after everything he's done and everything he still wants to leave the door open just like a, a regular scared old man doesn't want to be alone with his thoughts leave the door open for protection thing i think it's like a leave the door open so you're not alone if i die someone will sure you know be right on the other side of the door ready to come see to me yeah did you take it at all as like leaving the door open to in, in the sense that he didn't learn his some of his lessons and like realize things about like leaving the door open to maybe my daughter will come around at some point. I don't know, door open to other possibilities in that sense. 
I think, yeah, maybe figuratively and maybe like to an extent that he, he yeah. wants that. But I think he and we as an audience both know that won't happen, even if he's holding out hope for it. Yeah. Yeah, certainly like He's holding out hope for his soul as well. But I also think that no matter how much praying he does, he's pretty screwed on that department. But yeah, I took it the same things that you guys did. And I just, I have... It was uh, when it was about to happen. I, you know, you. I think at that point of the movie, you're kind of like, "How's this going to end? Like, what is, is the end's got to be coming soon?" I think it felt kind of surprising that that was the last line, but as soon as it ended, I was like, oh, "Okay, it makes sense." Yeah, it um, feels right. Yeah, it doesn't have that. It's it's a good finale, but without feeling like, look at this final line, <laughs> and look mm-hmm. at this final moment. Yeah, uh, it doesn't feel too like self-assured in its finality did you guys know that once jimmy hoffa uh gets shot there is still 40 minutes left in the movie uh not exactly (laughs) yeah it's a long movie i think my favorite scene in the entire movie though is whenever he's in front of the nursing home in his wheelchair and the two cops are like frank just tell us what's going on everyone's dead Mm -hmm. like who are you being loyal to right now it'll die with you unless you tell us and he's just like yeah i'm not gonna tell you (laughs) Yeah, the, it's one of those like slightly admirable things, like, but also kind of sad at the same time because I felt like it's like it's admirable, but I think on the surface where you're like, oh, he's not going to tell, and he's like, whatever. But I think like you get down to it, and it's it's like, like his loyalty. It is well, his loyalty is one of the things that defines his character, mm-hmm. and even though everybody's gone and nobody's going to get hurt, who is he if he gives up that information? What? Yeah. Isn't the point that it was worthless to begin with, and he and I guess at no point did he ever give up that you know his loyalty. I guess, but I don't necessarily think that I find it admirable. And I guess he did it because he gave it all away to the book guy. <laughs> but that's what's so good about this movie, right? Like, it can be admirable, it can be not admirable, depending on how you look at it. It could be pointless, it could be a futile gesture, or it could be everything. His life could be meaningless if he gives up this information now, because otherwise, what was it all for? Or, you know, it could be saved if he stops being loyal to these people that are even no longer alive. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, which which is the best path to take for a guy like this? But ultimately, he does give it all up in the book, right? <laughs> so, But on his own terms, not to the cops yeah, or anything like that's that. That's true, yeah. And he didn't want it... Am I, am I conflating something else, but, like, he didn't want it to come out till after he was dead or something? Oh, Maybe. I might have read that somewhere or something, or I might be mixing up something else that I heard. I don't know. But yeah, I don't have anything else on The Irishman unless you guys do. Uh, no, that does it for me. Really great. Yeah, really like it. Uh, one of my favorite movies of the year so far, but I will have to see kind of where it all lands at the end. But it's definitely a contender for a top five. Yeah, it's up there for me, too. Mm-hmm. I would be surprised if enough movies come to to knock knock it it out of my top 10 you know cool well then that does it for our bonus episode yeah if you guys have any thoughts on the irishman anything we missed or think we completely got wrong write us in let us know we might read it on the show if you have any interesting hot takes yeah for sure and to that point thank you so much for listening and thank you if you do write in Mm -hmm. and also thank you jake wagner russell for doing our Mm -hmm. intro and outro music if you want to hear more of his music, you can do so at soundcloud.com slash bopscotch. Mm-hmm. Stay tuned to this channel. We just put out an episode on Knives Out. And next week, we should be putting out an episode on Marriage Story. And in January, we will return to our every other week being a casually criterion episode. So don't worry if you are tired of all the new content. <laughs> new movie yeah. content, that is. Yep, and then, like Mike said, if you want to send in some thoughts on the Irishman, or if you've got questions or topics you want us to discuss on Marriage Story, you can send those to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Casual Cinecast. Thanks so much for listening, guys, and we will see you next time. Uh, uh, bye. <laughs>